Um, let's see if they'll advance. That's the other problem. Uh, yeah, here we go. All right, so here we are. Thank you again. Um, I also want to start a timer. Uh, Great, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit as, as Mark did um, and as Daniel did about epilepsy genetics in the context of the promise of precision, which is really what we've been um, building up to with all of our precision diagnosis. Um, and I'll just go over in broad strokes some gene-based strategies uh, for treatment that we're moving towards in the field. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about which genes or, or cases should be pursued. And Jackie had asked me to talk about why gene-based therapies uh, might be likely to succeed or why they may fail. And I'd like to turn the focus a little bit with my glass half full in terms of how can we maximize the success of these sorts of therapies. So just a uh, brief overview and apologies to those who were at the RRE a couple of weeks ago. These are very similar to what I presented there, but I thought it was important to mention, um, you know, as, as Mark did, that, that we really need to have a synergy between our clinical world, which is, which is what I'm depicting in this inner purple circle uh, and the research world that all of us are also living in. And so this inner circle represents us in clinic. Uh, for me, that's Tuesday afternoons where I diagnose individuals with epilepsy. I will do a genetic evaluation if I can, although as you heard, there are a lot of barriers to, uh, uh, that are in the way of doing that. And we've actually taken to a whole parallel research sequencing um, enterprise if we can't do clinical testing. Um, and then clinical treatment, which was largely empiric. You heard a lot of genes in Mark's talk and you'll see a lot of gene names in my slides coming up. Um, and many of those actually now have treatments uh, that are, if not precision therapies and mechanistic therapies, at least treatments based on those diagnoses. And so that's really evolving very rapidly, uh, but we'd like that to be the, the rule and not the exception for our patients that we can actually have mechanism-based therapies. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing, there we go. So how do we synergize between our clinical world and the research enterprise? Well, rather than seeing one patient at a time, we can certainly put gene-based therapies and syndrome-based uh, groups together, together in registries to try to take stock of all of the information that all of our patients offer uh, together as a group. Sorry, I'm not, there we go. Um, we have to keep our gene discoveries uh, efforts up because we haven't actually figured out all the genes or mechanisms. There's a whole enterprise involved with doing expert variant review because every variant that you see in someone you sequence may not necessarily be disease associated. So it's really important to vet those carefully. Uh, something we're very closely involved with, with Ingo Helbig at CHOP and Heather Mefford at St. Jude. Uh, we need to then do functional assessment in animal models and cell-based models so we can move quickly from the functional assessments of what is going on to cause epilepsy to preclinical trials in these same models. Um, and there it's really important to synergize with our clinical world. So we are looking at the types of outcomes or features in these models that approximate our patients and what they're experiencing. And then finally, we hope we'll have precision treatment for more and more of our patients. So what do we do in the interim? What do we do while we're building this, this whole pipeline and trying to get there for all of our patients? Well, when we see patients in the clinic or we see patients in the NICU, for example, we make a syndrome-based diagnosis based on the type of seizures, the age of onset, the accompanying neurodevelopmental and other features that a child may have. Um, and then that may suggest a list of genes that we should be thinking about. So if, for example, if you have an early onset epilepsy, Otohara syndrome or epilepsy of infancy with an epileptic encephalopathy, immediately the child neurologist would think KCNQ2, that's one of the most common genes. Also SCN2A, also a couple of other genes, but the syndrome that presents with tonic seizures in the first week of life, hopefully with rapid sequencing in our NICUs, which many of us are starting to do, we can go from having this phenotypic syndromic diagnosis that doesn't really help us inform treatment to a quick hypothesis about what genes might be involved to a rapid genome-based diagnosis that can get us there very, very quickly. And then we can pursue perhaps precision therapies, but also perhaps at least rational therapies based on empiric evidence. EIMFS, which is kind of a mouthful, is epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures. Um, and there, the, the first gene that we now think about is KCNT1, uh, but there's a whole host of, of genes that we know are associated with, most of them heterozygous variants, so one copy affected, um, and most of them de novo, so not inherited, although some are inherited. A number of recessive disorders as well here in the orangey-brown section, and a few X-linked disorders as well. Um, contrast these where there's a lot of different genes involved and still some 
third or so of them unsolved, contrast with Dravet syndrome, which you heard about from Daniel, um, where almost invariably the gene associated with Dravet syndrome or severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy is associated with SCN1A. So if, if a child neurologist sees someone with hemiclonic seizures, followed by with fever, followed by afebrile GTCs, and then a regression and an evolution of the EEG, and then an, an onset of myoclonic seizures in the first few months and early second year of life, we think Dravet syndrome, and we should very swiftly move to getting sequencing, copy number assessment of sequencing is negative, genome, if everything else is negative, to find that SCN1A variant. And that, as you, you'll, you'll hear in future talks, is really important, not only for diagnostic and prognostic purposes, but for clinical trial eligibility. And finally, I'll contrast these with infantile spasms, which my slides are kind of going out of order. Um, infantile spasms, which is one of the most common of these collectively rare early onset, largely genetically influenced epilepsies. We see infantile spasms every couple of weeks on average at a busy uh, tertiary care epilepsy center. Um, this is something that affects one in 2000 or so infants. And so this is really, really quite common. Um, and the causes are many. And so you really have to take a broad strokes approach, look at lots of different genes. We're moving from panels and microarrays to exomes and really moving quickly from exomes to genomes to be able to do more rapid and more comprehensive assessment of what's going on genetically so we can move away from our empiric therapies to something more precise. So we see one patient at a time, but we have a collective approach. We'll look at their DNA and if we can solve their epilepsy based on the DNA, maybe we'll come across an mTOR pathway abnormality or an ion channelopathy as you've been hearing about or other genes that may be involved. And that may suggest treatment. So we have mTOR inhibitors. We have uh, ion channel addressing therapies that are growing in number. Um, and lots of other genes that may have other treatments. And, and if we can't find an answer look based, in, based on the DNA assessment, uh, then we may have to look at RNA. We may have to look for ex expression profiles that'll tell us which of these pathways are involved. Um, and sorry, I'm having trouble advancing, but we may find patterns that approximate the pattern seen in these other uh, individuals with these solved DNA features, and then we can apply the same types of treatments and the same pathway-based approach. Um, I might need some help advancing. Is there someone there who can advance? It's kind of erratically advancing. Um, I'll just make the point that it's not just three colors, right? And not just three pathways. We have a lot of different uh, types of um, genes involved with epilepsies and we need to be able to address all of them with some precision. If I could have the next slide, please. So gene-based therapies, uh, next. So why do we need them? You've heard already uh, our anti-seizure medications for many patients do fine, but they have side effects. But for many patients and particularly our young children with these early onset epilepsy, efficacy is incomplete. And one in three patients overall have refractory seizures, more so in this early onset group. Targeted therapies might be as simple as correcting a biochemical deficiency in the pandemic, we started doing research-based sequencing for kids who couldn't have clinical sequencing. And in the over 750 kids we've sequenced in the last couple of years, we've actually identified a, a quick, immediate cause in about 20% of them. Um, that being said, how many of them had quickly addressable biochemical de deficits? Only a couple. And so we, we live for those moments when we can give someone something oral to supplement what they're missing, but that's the, the small minority. More often we'll find a pathway to modulate, as I've mentioned, um, or maybe we'll find variants in genes that will allow someone to at least be part of a clinical trial. Uh, so what kinds of trials are we moving towards? We've heard about some of the the more general types of therapies, but we really now wanna hone in on the specific gene and the specific variant in some cases that's giving rise to a patient's epilepsy. I'll just go over in broad strokes and point out a couple of review articles that I found very helpful in trying to digest what are all these different strategies. Um, and in a nutshell, we have antisense oligonucleotide approaches, which can essentially target mRNA and lead to the degradation of target mRNA if we want to eliminate one copy that's not, uh, the right copy of the gene or not the correct copy of a gene, or we can also try to work uh, through a number of different mechanisms to increase the expression uh, of the proper isoform of a gene. So that's one type of strategy. There are others in development uh, to also try to give you more of the right copy, more of the good copy if you're missing one of them. Alternately, you can try to deliver exogenous DNA. Back in the dark ages a few years ago when we said, well, we know about these genes like SCN1A and KCNQ2, why, and if somebody's missing one copy because they've got a truncated form and it's getting degraded, why can't we just give them, you know, through a lentivirus or an AV, why don't we just 
deliver it. And part of the challenge was some of these genes, like SCN1A and so on, they're, they're big genes, they're hard to package in, but maybe there are strategies to be able to put in the right amount of the right uh, DNA that can allow us to express uh, exogenous protein, or in some cases, degrade target mRNA that's that's causing trouble. And so there's a couple of different approaches. You're going to hear about these in much more detail, so I won't go into the mechanisms. I can't do it justice in a brief talk, but just to say there are a lot of different strategies, and it's not just that we're talking about them now, but some of them are really ready for prime time and being introduced into patients. There's some Risks and benefits that I want to really get into, but I want to just mention uh, in particular comparing ASOs to uh, gene replacement or gene editing is that we can get down to the variant specific level, not just the gene specific level with the ASOs, which can be attractive uh, because what it can do is minimize um, in some cases, some of the disadvantages, which include off target effects. Um, so we have pros and cons to each of these. None of them is perfect. Um, all of them are quite complicated. Um, and we have the added uh, complication that if you're not making any of the right protein because your DNA is, is abnormal on both copies of your, your uh, gene product, then you may have immunogenicity, your brain cells, your body's immune system may not recognize the product that ensues as normal. So that's a problem. Um, and the real problem, I think, for, for this discussion, if I can advance to that, um, is that we don't know what the efficacy is in epilepsy for any of these, really. We've had some nice early experiences. We've been able to show feasibility of a system where these can be delivered in animal models, they can be delivered in cellular models, and they can be delivered in people, which is really exciting. And I think our best example from child neurology, zooming out a little bit, and moving away from epilepsy is in spinal muscular atrophy. We never thought we would see children with SMA sit and walk and survive and not need feeding tubes and breathing tubes, and they are now. And so that's really shown us the promise in a non-brain part of the nervous system. Now the question is, can we do this in the brain? Can we not only deliver successfully and safely, but can we actually show efficacy? So who should we pursue and which genes, which cases are gonna be most amenable to this sort of therapy? Um, where do we start? We have all these different options. How do we start so we maximize success in this area? So I look at this really as a question of potential benefits versus potential risks. And so I'll outline these in general. The potential benefits, of course, are our outcomes. You've heard about seizure outcomes and non-seizure outcomes, both being critically important um, for practical reasons. It may be more straightforward and readily um, accessible to study seizure outcomes, but we can't forget the non-seizure outcomes that affect our patients every single day. Um, what are some of the potential benefits? We can see them from our preclinical data that there are benefits both in seizure and non-seizure outcomes, and that's really important. And we may have some early clinical reports that show us the pathway towards potential benefits uh, for the different classes of therapy, but also for specifically for some genes. What are some of the risks? Uh, we have known risks of delivery. If we have to do intrathecal delivery, of course, there's risk of infection, there's risk of inflammation, there's potential risk of increased intracranial pressure, there are potential unknown risks. We've been learning this as we go, which is a little bit scary. And so um, this really lead, leads to a lot of monitoring being required for everything that we know to expect, but also open mind that we might see some new things that we need to monitor for and amend our protocols to incorporate looking for those side effects down the line. And I'll put here also unrealistic expectations I think everybody in this room has realistic expectations, but not a Tuesday goes by when someone doesn't come and say, you've got the diagnosis, that's great. Why aren't you already starting to make an ASO for our, our child? And I understand that, right? We've made a lot of discussion. Brandy and I and others have talked about precision therapy for years and we're really excited about it, but we also have to make sure we do things in a, in a safe way, in a systematic way, and really in, in as much as we can through trials that can give us generalizable knowledge that will let us get to a much broader and bigger group of patients. So I think we've reached equipoise. I think our potential benefits and potential risks are where they need to be to pursue trials. And that's what's going on now, which is very exciting. I'll just quickly um, mention that I think there's a third arm of this scale, that, which is also let's make sure we consider alternative options for treatment. So for any child, if you're thinking about there's risks, there's benefits, there's also the question of have we done what can we, we can do that's simpler, that's lower risk, um, and that might have a similar impact. So I'll just go through really quickly a uh, Batten disease example you may have heard about from Tim Yu's group. This was a patient customized oligonucleotide therapy that specifically addressed one allele of a recessive or biallelic disorder um, such that more protein could be made and that we could potentially partially rescue the regression phenotype of Batten disease. Now this child um, had a reduction in seizures and that was the primary outcome, but did not have necessarily a, a 
reduction in her overall symptomatology related to Batten disease, and she did unfortunately pass away. Um, we can't really say that that was any uh, longer than it would have been had she not received this ASO. This therapy, though, was the, the inception of it was in um, in 2016, and, and Tim's group was very quickly able to in vitro find an ASO that potentially would work and show that delivery could be done after some toxicology and rodents um, to be able to show that this delivery ASO could be delivered safely and at least uh, show some potential effect for seizures. So we had preclinical data, we had the possibility of a disease modification, slow progression, um, and then we had potential known and unknown risks um, and some pretty high expectations that I don't know that we necessarily met, but we were able to show that the system worked and that this was feasible for other disorders and potentially for other kids if we could treat them earlier uh, with Batten disease. I'm trying to move, here we go. Um, I think we did reach equipoise as we have for other conditions and I'll try to move faster if I can advance. Um, here we go. And our alternatives for treatment were not many. Um, the mechanisms of a lot of the ASOs you're gonna hear about uh, for Dravet syndrome, which is another case, suppose you have a two-year-old child with Dravet syndrome, as you, as you heard about from Daniel, how Natasha would have been at two years of age, could we intervene then? For many kids with Dravet syndrome, they have a loss of function variant. They have, they're not missing a full copy in most cases, but they've got a shortened copy or a truncated copy. Um, and what I'm trying to show you is that um, most of our, there we go. Most of us um, uh, have the capacity to, whether we have Dravet syndrome or not, we have the capacity to increase the amount of SCN1A we make um, if we can silence what's called, been called a poison exon. If we can silence an early truncation in the normal copy, we could get more SCN1A. So you could do that for anybody. So you could specifically do this for a child with Dravet syndrome. Um, sorry, this, I'm really having trouble advancing, going back and forth, sorry about that. Um, so what we can do is target with this little purple, um, symbol here being the ASO, you could actually target and basically effectively silence this exon. Um, nice review here by Aziz et al. going through the, the mechanisms if you'd like to look more into those. But the idea here is to not only do this for SCN1A, but if it's successful or for SCN1A, to potentially target other genes that have the same type of mechanism and have these same extra um, poison exons causing early truncation in, you know, in some transcripts in all of us. And so there's a whole host of genes, ion channel and otherwise, where this might apply. So it's very exciting to know that this is now moving into the trials uh, stage where we can actually look um, across many kids with this one disorder, but potentially apply the same science and the same trial designs to other children with other genetic epilepsies. Um, so lots of, sorry, lots of preclinical uh, data suggesting that this might be helpful, certainly for seizure control, maybe for developmental improvement, which is really what we're after as well. Uh, we have known risks of ASOs, potential tar off target effects as well, um, and also potential unknown risks of novel experimental therapies that we have to come up against. And then we just have to be realistic, right? We can mitigate unrealistic expectations by trying to be realistic and letting people know what's, what's going on in the field. So I think we have that. And with Dravet and many of the other early onset severe epilepsies we see, we don't have great alternatives. What we have uh, is a lot of other medications that haven't worked as well, even if they've been partially effective. Uh, we have, um, in, a, in addition to that, we have the risk of the status quo, which is the risk of pseudo. Um, so, what about other types of disorders? I won't go into this, but I think it's important to note that, you know, we need to think about the right gene, the right mechanism, the right child, the right symptoms and the right outcomes to approach to get this right. And in some cases we don't have loss of function, but we have gain of function. Um, and that too, with proper targeting, proper recognition, proper targeting can also be addressed with some of these gene specific approaches. Um, so hopefully I can get to my conclusion slide, which is how do we maximize the chance of success with gene-based therapies? Um, precision medicine starts with precision diagnosis. You heard about that really nicely from Mark, that we've got to get to our patients and we've got to get to them earlier so we can target the right gene, the right mechanism in the right place, meaning the right part of the brain, the right cells in the brain, the right cells at the right time. Um, and hopefully as we do this earlier and earlier, we'll have better chance of long-term outcomes improving. Um, what outcomes are we looking at? You have to look at the right outcomes to be able to see a delta, um, both from a meaningfulness perspective in terms of our, our clinical practice and our patients and families, but also if we have a, a change in seizure reduction or development, or perhaps a biomarker that might be altered by a treatment, 
And that's something we better be measuring if we're gonna be able to demonstrate efficacy across several patients. And then finally, while the seizure reduction can be short-term, the developmental improvement can be short to medium, but it may be long-term, survival is an important metric I think we have to think about, not in the context of a specific trial that a company might be sponsoring that an institution might undertake, but long-term as a, as a field, we really do need to look at survival. Um, so I'll leave you with these as our potentials for success. Um, and the, uh, the question I'd like to leave in your minds is if this works or when this works and in certain circumstances, how can and should we increase the scale? We've got to diagnose all of the right kids with these genetic epilepsies early enough. So that's already a challenge that we have to face in terms of distribution of resources and equity. But how do we get all of these kids into this pipeline uh, so all of them can have advantages of getting the most precise treatment possible? So with that, I will, I will thank you and I'll try to thank the, the village that is my team who is working on all aspects of, of this. Um, maybe if someone can help me advance my last to my last uh, slide and um, I'll hopefully leave you with some, some thoughts to ponder about uh, in the discussion. Thanks.